I'm too excited. I think we're going to get started. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Haas X. My name is Kelly McElhaney, and I'll be your MC for today. This is my favorite. I saw Elizabeth said this is her favorite event. This is absolutely my favorite event of the year. This has been going on since 2013. So you are here at the ninth annual Haas X. Uh, my name is Kelly McElhaney again. I've been on the Haas faculty since 2002. I founded, currently I founded the Center for Equity, Gender and Leadership. Um, now I run that with a fantastic team. It is focused on educating equity fluent leaders to ignite and accelerate change. And to that goal of equity and diversity and inclusion, there is a fantastically diverse, I call it the diversity bouquet of speakers today. You're in for a treat. We have six alumni speakers, uh, similar to TEDx, but I have to be honest, we're better than TEDx speakers because, you know, Berkeley, Haas. Couple of things in the interest of being inclusive, you can put turn on closed caption. If you see down in your toolbox, you'll see closed caption. If you hit the upward arrow, you say uh, turn on subtitles. So I think we're gonna be ready. A couple of other things. There's no Q and A during the talks, but we are doing something for the first time this year and adapting to our current remote environment after the speakers have finished, I'll come back on. We have a surprise in store for you. So very excited about that. And then I'll give you more details in terms of how to go into the speaker room. So are you ready? Here we go. We are zooming it in, Bears style. Our first speaker, amazing, Ace Patterson. He's a full-time MBA alum of 2016. His talk is called The Art of Legitimacy, but let me just tell you something about his background. He is also known as Call Me Ace. I want that on my card, Ace. He is an independent hip hop artist with an MBA, um, millennial professional, a disruptor who absolutely challenges the status quo. In 2019, Ace relieved, released his debut album called Airplane Mode, only debuted at number three on iTunes top 40 US hip hop album chart, as well as number 50 on the Billboard R&B and hip hop album sales chart. Since then, he has released several more EPs. He has earned a significant amount of media attention, uh, 1 million plus Spotify streams. Just last week, he made it into the top 10 in BET's Amplified. Uh, where they were searching for the hottest unsigned musical artist, which is Call Me Ace. Recently, his song, No Assistance, got a placement in the official NBA 2K21 Next Gen video game. Um, finally, he's determined, this is near and dear to my heart, to use his music, professional knowledge, artistry as a gateway to connect with disenfranchised communities. He encourages his supporters, which we will now quickly become, I already am, to live a rich life, not just a life full of riches. Ace received his undergraduate degree from Columbia University and so happily for us, his MBA from Berkeley Haas. Over to you, call me Ace. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you, thank you. And uh, virtual, what's good to everybody that's on this call. The thing about being legit is it's not about where you are, how old you are, or if anybody around you even believes you are. At 19, I decided I'm going to create a hip hop student group. And mind you, I'm at Columbia, where the music major is more about Beethoven than it is about Biggie Smalls. <laughs> you know, Columbia is not really the, the, the hip hop mecca of universities, right? And yet I was determined with my friends, we're going to start this really dope group called Kush, the Columbia University Society of Hip Hop. Sounds official, right? <laughs> we didn't sign any official paperwork with the campus, but for the remaining two years as I was on campus, we operated and grew like an official student group. We had events all around campus using all of the free spaces, the outside the library, the dorm rooms, study rooms. Uh, our, our events were growing by the ones, the tens, the hundreds. Uh, we were 
attracting people all across New York City. And our presence was so known on campus that it was unanimously decided that we would be the ones to open up for Snoop Dogg in front of 26,000 people while we were on campus. <laughs> our articles and radio interviews started to pour in. I was even considered one of the 13 most outstanding seniors before graduating. And Kush right now, it's technically an official student group by uh, Columbia standards. Um, even a couple months ago, there was an article that was written saying uh, Kush is a uh, intrinsically linked uh, with Columbia University and the evolution of hip hop in New York City. Kush is literally an official artifact for Columbia's history. And who knew any of that would happen? See, all I wanted was just a safe space to belong and for my art and my culture to exist where I was, period. I didn't wait for anybody to say I could. I decided I could. Now, after college, I stopped rapping because uh, I had a come to Jesus moment. I didn't really like the images or the lyrics that I was portraying. But before graduating from UC Berkeley Haas, I had a conversation with a close homie of mine back home and he, he reignited my love for this art form that I had been nurturing since I was a kid. But see, the biggest hurdle that I had to overcome at that time was, am I a legitimate rapper? A 25 year old soon to be graduate from a top 10 MBA program, uh, about to be a strategy consultant, about to get married. I'm no longer rapping about money or drugs or the traditional mainstream rap topics. Yeah, yeah, I am. Spring semester, second year, I and a classmate of mine, Bomi, we created this song called Yoho, You Only Haas Once. You might have heard of it, you might not have heard of it. And that's okay, I'm not offended either way. But let me just tell you, that song went a little mini viral on campus. We performed in front of large crowds multiple times before graduating. Articles were written, we had merch. Uh, people were graduating with the Yoho logo on their hat. It was good times. But um, no one requested me to make Yoho. It's not like Dean Lyons came to me and was like, ah, uh, we, Ace, we, we need a way to increase recruiting, boost recruiting numbers. Are you a rapper? <laughs> nah, see, our class was saying Yoho around campus all the time, but Yoho the song was just my way to express love for the people and the community and the transformational culture that, that we've just been a part of for the past two years. And if I knew that five years later, Haas faculty was going to be sharing this song as a way to show how dope our MBA program is, I mean, I would have at least used an original beat so that way we could hit the billboard charts, you know what I mean? But it's all good. See, seeing the impact that we had on, on, on the class and the generation of classes to come, that only validated that which I knew deep inside was already true. I am legit. And five years later, the world's still catching on. Literally yesterday, I just finished a two day commercial uh, starring as Call Me A's. This is a really big company, and I can't tell you anything more about it because I'm under a non disclosure agreement. But let me just tell y'all the accolades and the awards, those don't make me legit because they're just confirming that which I already know is true. And if those awards do not come in, it's all good because guess what? I still exist and I'm still legit. I don't wait for the world to validate my path. I don't base my legitimacy on the status quo. Even when I was a kid, I had this revelation that, you know what, even if it's unconventional, even if it's quote unquote, not the way that things are done, if that makes sense for me, it makes sense. That's how it's gonna be done. The world will catch on eventually and who knows, maybe your photo will get taken and your passion will be immortalized in a yearbook for a school that you didn't even go to. <laughs> the art of legitimacy is so ingrained that when you connect with me on Instagram, which I hope you do, you'll see my handle is literally call me ace legit. Thank you. Wow. Unbelievable start. This is why we love Haas. This is why we love this event. Yes, B. Look at that. Um, you are legit. Ace completely, and I can't wait until the rest of the world and the whole world knows that. I forgot the best part of your bio. Ace uh, says that he is he has a wife. We know he has a wife. He doesn't just say that. Who, according to Ace, is 25 times a better person than Ace. I think she probably feels the same way about you, Ace. I know I just think you're phenomenal. The mark you left on 
Columbia with Kush, the mark, mark you left on Haas with Yoho. There's somebody who wants to know, how do you get the merch? We still want the merch. You are legit. I'm glad you didn't wait for the world to tell you. So thank you so much, Ace. Yep, uh, amazing Ace. Oh, our second speaker is now Varinda Gupta, full-time full MBA 20, 2020. The title of her talk is Find Your Why. A little bit about her background. She's the founder and CEO of Sequin. I think it's a fantastic name. She's on a mission to get women the credit that we deserve. Who knew credit scores were as biased as they are? She was at Visa, check this out, for six years building popular credit cards and then was rejected from the very card she was ready to launch. Determined to demystify credit cards for over 70% of women who are not engaging with the credit optimally today, she launched Sequin to build a first of its kind autonomous financial platform to guide women towards favorable credit outcomes and accessible lending products, very, very important throughout our lifetimes. Visa is supported by, I'm sorry, Sequin is supported by Visa, IDEO, Angel Investors, including the Schwab family, with over 90% of whom, as her investors, identify as women. She received her undergraduate degree from the other UC, UCLA. My daughter goes there, so I could never say anything disparaging, nor would I. Her MBA from Haas just last spring. She's a proud first-generation Indian immigrant and lives here in San Francisco. So over to you, Brenda. Thank you so much for being here. It's 2016, and I'm sitting at my desk at Visa. Today is the day that I'm finally able to submit a credit card application for the Chase Sapphire Reserve, the credit card my team and I had toiled over over the past two years. We'd flown all over the US to interview customers tested thousands of value propositions and sourced the coolest perks. The rest of my team had already applied for the card and had been instantly accepted, and they would occasionally drop the cards on their desks and we'd hear the clanging sound of a signature blue metal. As a main product manager, I had been so heads down taking care of unforeseen logistics stemming from the wild popularity of the product that I hadn't had a moment to fill out the application. But today was finally the day. My whole team was gathered around my screen as I began filling out the card application fields. As excited as I was to experience the product for myself, this application held a special meaning for me. My family and I are first generation immigrants from India and we were very wary of the credit system in the US. My mom was especially distrustful of the financial system and she refused to use credit products at all. So growing up, I would watch this independent woman who had come to America and built a new life from scratch for herself and for her family become dependent on my dad if she ever needed to borrow money on credit. With this application, I would be the first woman in the history of my family to start building credit in my own name and access the opportunities that credit could afford. The magnitude of the moment turned into excitement and I took a final look around, saw my colleagues and with a deep breath, I clicked submit. Your application has been rejected. To say I was in disbelief was an understatement. I had just been rejected from the credit card that I had built. Another emotion started to bubble up. Imposter syndrome that I had buried deep within me since my first day of work. On my team at Visa, I knew I was different. I was on average 30 years junior to these credit veterans I was the only woman product manager and the only first generation immigrant. To prove my worth every day, I honed my industry expertise to ensure that I was always overprepared with facts, figures, data, and insights. But as I stared at the rejection screen, 
none of it mattered. It's like the financial system knew my deepest insecurity, that someone like me wasn't deserving of being included in the credit system. More devastating was I felt just as helpless as my mom always expected she would with credit. I believed that my industry expertise would help me avoid the pitfalls, but how was I supposed to empower my mom or anybody else when I couldn't even do it for myself? Unsure, I glanced over at my boss, the head of credit cards at Visa, who was also staring at my screen with one eyebrow raised in surprise. His, his disbelief validated mine. And then I snapped back to my senses. The fact of the matter was, I was deserving. I knew the ins and outs of the system. And heck, I was an industry expert who had written the rules that every Visa card issuer nationwide needed to follow. Most importantly, I knew the truth. This rejection had nothing to do with me or my qualifications. The financial system was never designed to give credit to people like me. That day, I found my why. I made it my mission with Sequin to fundamentally redesign financial services to center women for the first time and quite literally get women the credit we deserve. It became critical to teach women the rules of the credit game Build their, credit build their credit profiles so no other woman felt like the financial system wasn't designed to include her and create tailored credit products to women so credit would never be the barrier to her opportunity. When I found my why, everything changed. The harder path started to become the obvious one. When I received shiny offers to work at big banks during my MBA, it was easy for me to say no. I never intended on being an entrepreneur, but I knew that the financial system required a fundamental redesign to meet women's needs and that I was uniquely suited to solve this problem. When I was fundraising for Sequin and a group of all men were willing to invest the entire round, I realized the importance of including women onto our cap table, even if it meant a much more arduous fundraising process. And I'm proud to say 92% of our cap table is women, including the women of the Schwab family, which is the flip from the norm of Silicon Valley startups. On the days I wake up and my desk at Visa feels particularly inviting, I think about the women whose credit scores we've built up on average 20 points in one week using our technology and hundreds of their stories of feeling financially confident and not reliant on anybody else. And when I haven't slept for multiple nights and no number of Starbucks lattes seems to be doing the trick, I call my mom and I hear her say, because of Sequin, I'm not afraid of the financial system anymore and every hard moment is worth it. So what keeps me going? Every day, I bet on my expertise. I bet on the women before me and the women who will come after me to ensure that we have equal access to the opportunity and to the credit that we deserve. I found my why. Thank you. The smile is contagious. The ability, just like Ace, to push away that status quo, redefine the rules, include her equity fluent leader in Verinda writ large. So, so proud that you're why I love Haas. Glad that you, like Ace, didn't wait for the world to tell you you're legitimate. Two great legitimizing stories here and hard work, pushing boundaries. You're not an imposter. Um, addressing barriers, increasing access, fighting the good fight. So excited. Miranda, congratulations. We'll all watch for more success along with ACE on the world stage. I'm excited to introduce our next speaker. I think everybody needs to include a Texan 
in their lives. So we brought one to you. Uh, John Altshuler, he's a full-time MBA graduate. I'm gonna go ahead and tell the year, John, 2001. He, he told us he was the oldest person in the room and I giggled. The title of his talk is Share the Power. Um, he's a Texan, as I said, I don't know why I keep calling that out. Look at his backdrop, it's gorgeous. He's worked his entire career in the Dallas commercial real estate industry. He's a civic leader, a social activist. I happen to find him to have a fantastic sense of humor. On to you. Go, John. Thank you, Kelly. I asked the university what they wanted me to talk about, and they said anything. Here's the deal. You tell a Texan he gets to speak to a group of Californians about anything, he's going to talk a lot about Texas. Before I go completely Texas, I want to ask a serious question for reflection. What have you done since the murder of George Floyd? First, it's important to acknowledge that inequalities and inequities have existed in our society for hundreds of years before George Floyd. But I picked that moment because it was so vivid and because the period of time, the 11 months of time that followed are so quantifiable. My answer to that question I struggled with it for weeks, for months, but my answer is improving. And I believe it's important that all of our answers to that question improve. And that's the point of my talk. I'd like to start with a quick video excerpt from the television show in the 1980s, Dallas. For those of you who don't know the show, it's a precursor to shows like Succession and Billions. In this scene, you're gonna see the antagonist's wife the little, the little brother, Bobby, over his lack of power. Rules. JR always says that when it comes to power, there are no rules. Well, that's why my brother and I part company. I don't want power for our sake. Don't worry about it, Bobby. You'll never get it. And what makes you so sure, Sullivan? It's all a game, Bobby. You have to love it to play it well. Making a study of power, are you? Don't you forget who I've been married to for the last 10 years. He understands power. He controls and manipulates. He makes people afraid. He's a natural born fighter. Best. And me? You are JR's little brother. So set aside the big hair and the belittling talk and the mean tone and focus instead on the essence of Sue Ellen's message and Bobby's reception to the message. You aren't good enough. You don't have what it takes. Bobby believes it. I feel that too often this reflects the self-talk that happens in our own heads. Others are better. What I can do doesn't measure up. And so therefore I don't do all that I can. This is the downside of comparing our power to others. We can mistakenly feel powerless. Think of the aggregated power on this call at this moment. Friends of the university, students, graduates. From the moment we stepped onto Berkeley's campus, we began to accumulate advantages, relationships, experiences, knowledge, ideas. These advantages are now part of our power. And here we sit today on this Zoom at the start of a decade as primed for social change as we've had in our lifetimes. We must each act on our power. Power is not zero sum, it's not finite. Power is infinite. It can be transferred, it can be shared. Don't be Bobby Ewing. You get to define how large your sphere of influence is, make it larger. Underestimating our individual power hurts all of us. Here are three examples of ways I've seen people like us use power effectively in Dallas this past year. Two friends invited seven acquaintances to join a nine person forum, multiracial, multi-religion, multi-gender. They gather every two weeks for an hour on Zoom. They discuss issues of equality. They gain understanding and perspective. This is power. Four leaders, multiracial, gather for a week 
gather for a walk every six weeks around a city lake. They invite one young person to join them who they know from a distance, but who they know if that young person knew them better, they could accelerate the trajectory of that young person's life. That is sharing friends, that is sharing power. Two leaders joined together to form a multiracial mentoring group of young people ages 16 to 27. This is power. The ways you can exercise power are virtually limitless. They don't involve the American president. They don't involve a CEO. You don't need the police chief. You don't need a legislative body. They can revolve simply around you. You can be deliberate about your next hire. You can research your local police department's policy on body cam video. If you're serving on civic boards and notice they feel clicky and homogenous, it's within your power to add additional members that changes that. What's stopping any of us from emulating the city of Evanston's racial reparations program and enacting the same in our own cities with private donations? If you don't like restrictive voting, voting laws, help disadvantaged Americans obtain voter ID. Enacting social change is within my power and your power. We can do it. Acknowledge your power, exercise your power, share your power. How will you use your power? Let's start now. Oh my gosh. Kenny, what amazing Haas alums you selected. Another equity fluent leader. I gotta say, John, when you said you're gonna play a clip of Dallas and JR, I didn't know, I, I said to Tenny, oh no, I don't know which way this is going, but it went perfectly. I just, there's so much here. You know, there's a great saying, I use myself and try to tell others when I'm teaching. You, you walk through life and you say, gosh, why doesn't somebody do something about that? And what John realized and is telling us, you are someone, we are someone, we can do something about that. And we have a lot of that right now. I agree, more opportunity right now to just to push social change than ever before. Use your power, but share your power. Be deliberate, deliberate, educate yourself, look around push back when you see only people like you at the table who's not at the table. What are you doing since the murder of George Floyd? Absolutely great question. Thanks, John. Give me lots of hope. Our next speaker, fourth in our lineup, Lisa Rawlings. She is an alum from the EMBA, Executive MBA program of 2019. The title of her talk is Redefining Our Leadership Principles. Lisa is currently the president and CFO, CEO of the Na National Urban Fellows, which is a social impact leadership accelerator for diverse professionals, another equity fluent leader um, who are committed, professionals who are committed to equity and social justice. She's a public service leader that takes such deep commitment and sacrifice, a strategist, a creative problem solver. And I wanna say to Joseph Epstein, this man who wrote a Wall Street Journal article uh, op-ed and said that Dr. Jill Biden is not really a doctor. Dr. Rawlings is really a doctor, just like Dr. Jill Biden. She's a lifelong learner. In addition to earning her MPA from Baruch College as a National Urban Fellow, she also holds her MSW and PhD, uh, PhD degree in social work from Howard University. She recently earned her MBA from Berkeley Haas, where she received awards for her values-based leadership. Lisa, I'm so excited, over to you. Thank you, Kelly. It's Thursday, May 10th, 2018, and it's my first day of the EMBA program. We're in Chu Hall, N570. We're in the center section on the top row. And to my left is Ben. He's a Navy fighter pilot. And to my right is Alex, he's a Navy SEAL. I'm a social worker in business school and my imposter syndrome is on fire. And yes, I'm nervous, I'm excited about the program and what I can learn and use to make broader impact. I'm thrilled to be around so many brilliant people with quick minds and warm smiles and kind hearts. We share this common set of principles that define our personal and professional aspirations for how we want to be in the world and what we aim to achieve. And they welcome me into the fold. 
but I'm also increasingly demoralized by and preoccupied with what's happening in our country. This explosion of racism, vitriol, and greed. But in this cozy Emba bubble, these experiences often felt like parallel universes. What we believe, what we see, and what we learn. So throughout my Hosh journey, I'm struggling to integrate the academic experience with this increasingly hostile reality I live and observe. In accounting class, Professor XJ is teaching us about depreciation of assets. And outside of Haas, Black people are being terrorized by police and vigilantes. Latinx families are being torn apart and Jewish worshipers are being slaughtered in their houses of prayer. I'm thinking about how we depreciate humanity. In this country's formative years, there were accounting treatments for enslaved people. What was the useful life of an infant or the salvage value of a grandmother? In finance, the topic is present and future values. Professor Brett Green is teaching us the ins and outs of what Einstein called the eighth wonder of the world, compounded interest. On the outside, I'm giving good student face, but on the inside, I'm seething. I'm thinking about the present value of the land that was stolen, the property that was confiscated, the genius that was hijacked, the labor that was torturously extracted for generation after generation after generation. And every day I live and breathe the impact of this wealth gap in my personal life and in the work I've done in impoverished communities. In research, Professor Lucas Davis is getting deep into regressions. I'm mindful that we're sitting in the Bay Area, the belly of the beast of income inequality. I'm wondering if we're committed to putting the greater good beyond our interests, then why does money seem to be the only dependent variable that we study? How are we measuring this greater good? And so at every turn, I wrestle with reconciling our shared principles and these cold realities. Can we somehow compartmentalize our values? And yes, I know this is business school. And in America, business isn't just about business. It's at the core of American values. And it speaks to the trade-offs we're willing to make in the pursuit of profits. And the vestiges of our ugly origin story leave a residue over everything we inherited. So let's be honest, for most people, this status quo is a horror show. This is what business as usual has gotten us. Profits over dignity, control over liberty, and property over life. It's gotten us to a place where the winners take all and the losers hope to just make it home alive. But this is Haas. This is not who we say we are. Since this is a conflict, this is our existential crisis. And in times of crises, we look to our values to guide us. What should the DLPs call us to do? Can we afford to do business as usual or business education as usual? As confident yet humble lifelong learners, can we consider that there could be different ways of thinking about business? If we're thinking beyond ourselves, are we peeking outside of our bubbles? If we want to question this status quo, are we willing to trade off comfort to confront painful truths? Are we up for taking responsibility for this world that we have shaped? If we believe that we can be a force for good in this world, it might be time to admit that what got us here will not get us to the world that we imagine. I invite us to put on our design thinking skills to the task and considering how might we step into the possibility of living more deeply and fully in our defining leadership principles in our own lives, in this Haas community and beyond. And at Haas with the brilliant minds, dedicated alumni, this cachet as an elite B school with a commitment to these principles, we have all the ingredients we need and we can tweak the recipe. It's time for us to redefine what defines us. Thank you.
I gotta put a sweater on. I just keep getting absolute chills of just inspiration and hope and just such pride that I'm a part of this Haas community. Comfort is a privilege, as Dr. Rawlings says. Get out of your comfort zone. Growth is only on the other side ever of your comfort zone. We need to believe, see, and learn, but also just be quiet and listen to other people's realities and lived experiences. Don't depreciate. We have been since the start of time, humanity, depreciating certain individuals and communities of humanity. I love this. Redefine the MPV. I can't wait to bring that back to Haas. Uh, when will we put a stop to the, just the horror that we are seeing today? The belly of the beast, income inequality, look around. What are you gonna do about it? You are somebody, you are Haas. Just, we can't return to normal. Lisa, your words remind me of a fantastic black female spoken word poet who talks about we cannot return to normal. Stop saying let's return to the pre-COVID normal. It just wasn't working for large swaths of the population. So Lisa, I'm just in awe. Thank you so much. Keeps getting better and better. B, you have a big tall bar to jump and I know you will. We have next as our fifth um, and all, second to last speaker. And remember a surprise after that, B Huiye. She got her undergraduate de degree from Haas in 2010. The title of her talk is how to save the world as one person, as somebody. Uh, B believes in intersectionality as a starting point to spur social progress in an, in an inclusive, accelerated, and meaningful manner, such a part of the mission for my center, EGAL. For over a decade, B has tackled change with some of the biggest players in the energy in industry, Fortune 500 companies and public institutions. Her thought leadership has been recognized across media outlets, Green Biz, Women in Clean Tech and Sustainability, UN Sustainable Development Goals, and more and more. She founded her own social impact consultancy, The Power of We, to enable business to be what we know it must be, a force for good. B, over to you. Thank you so much, Kelly. It's awesome to be in this Haas community. Everything I learned in school was a lie. Going beyond yourself, reconciling profit with purpose, believing that business is a force for good. Don't get me wrong. I love Cal like all of you. That's why I have Oski here next to me. And I soaked up everything Haas has to offer to an eager, optimistic undergrad. I built my career around this principle that doing good could mean doing well. That if you do right by people and the planet, it would show up in your business and its bottom line. But every time I pressure tested those principles, something fell off and I couldn't quite put my finger on it until about two years ago when it all felt like a big lie. I was in my office prepping for a meeting with executives, doing my power poses, feeling this confidence in my gut where I knew what I had to say was the right thing but the butterflies in my stomach and this voice of self-doubt in my head were really messing with that feeling of groundedness I needed. It was early September when a bunch of international events coincide around climate change, the UN General Assembly, climate weeks around the world, and more recently, a global climate strike, this youth-led movement demanding urgent intersectional climate action. I was working for a large company whose mission was to lead the energy transition to a more sustainable future. This was the type of mission-based climate work that I had dedicated my career to. I was proud to do this work and I was privileged to do it. I popped on my high heels for an added boost of confidence, muted that voice of self-doubt in my head, walked into the meeting and made my ask. What's our plan for the climate strike this month? The silence in the room was cringeworthy, but the question that followed next was worse. What strike? I realized the executives in the room had no awareness of this global movement happening around us. And after explaining it, 
that every one of them did not see corporations having a place in activism. The reputational risk was just too high. My consolation prize was that HR would put out a statement acknowledging the strike, but no employee that chose to participate in it would be endorsed or supported or given time off. They could participate at an arm's length from the company. I immediately regretted bringing this up. It seemed like the worst hill to decide to die on, and I had jeopardized any positive perception I had built up about me being a reliable corporate leader. Did I seem too radical? Had I given away my age being plugged into a youth movement? And had I wasted all of the political capital I had worked so hard to build up on something that seemed not really to matter? Up until that point, I wanted to climb the corporate ladder because I thought that's how I could save the world. Build power, amass influence, scale, solve climate change. But I realized that was entirely the wrong way to go about it. Being in a large corporation taught me that I had to be small. I had to apologize. I had to really think about sanding down the pointed edges of my personality and the principles that didn't jive with an often white, often male majority. As an immigrant, I grew up and learned that assimilation is your way to survival. I gave up parts of my heritage and precious pieces of my identity in order to blend in and get by and advance. I can't tell you how many times I've agonized over whether to change my name, specifically to anglicize it so that it's easier on other people to pronounce it the right way. This was just another time that I was being told to stay small, stay silent. But staying silent was creating this huge tension between my mission and my actions, my public posts and my private principles. And that's where everything I had learned in school felt like a lie. I expected business to embrace social impact, that racial equity could find a place in the core climate action that we were positing and that it would be obvious, an obvious decision to express our values with this global movement that was so aligned with our mission. The meeting wrapped up and I was so ready to forget about it. I wanted to bury the incident deep down next to all those other times where I had been afraid and ashamed to speak up. How could me as one person shift an entire company's culture? How could I change mindsets of executives? much less tackle the systemic challenge that climate change presents. A few weeks later, I received an email from a colleague. It said, thank you for your courage. Even though we're not marching today, you are making space for the rest of us. This one email, this little line, you are making space for us, has become my mantra. Every time I spoke up, whether it was to address a microaggression, push against the male stereotype of leadership, challenge a trope about Asians being submissive, I was making space for others, but also for myself. I was telling myself, your ego is not too big to change. Your upbringing is not too big to change. This team, this corporation, this system, this institution, is not too big to change. And that meant someone else heard that and felt that too. I became a founder because I believe in my ability and potential to first change my own mind, to believe in myself, and to bring my whole self to work. Being part of a big organization didn't allow me to do that. But as an entrepreneur, I can now focus on climate justice work, and that means honoring my roots in sustainability, grounded in indigenous practices. It means I can focus on communities at the front line of climate change, who very much like my ancestors are facing the brunt of a climate crisis that they had the least to do with. It means that I can tackle the core of oppression that is at the center of our climate change problem that will free us not just from the existential threat we're facing to our planet, but that so many Black Indigenous people of color are facing every day to their own existence. 
every time I speak up, I know I'm potentially jeopardizing my authority, my position, my power, even my own safety. But when that fear grows, I ask myself, what's at stake if you don't speak up? The power I stepped into in this meeting in all those moments when I trusted my gut, it's renewable, it's regenerative. It's got this ripple impact on my peers, my colleagues, even strangers who tell me, thank you for creating space. I underestimated that power and sometimes I still do. But having my values stomped on pushed me into a smaller and smaller corner until I decided to push back. Can I practice my principles, not just when I'm preaching, but in private when it's super scary, when it's inconvenient? I know I'll have more of these moments. I know I'll have more of these struggles, but I'm committed to turning them into opportunities to create space for others who will in turn create space for me. So for everyone who wants to make a positive difference and change the world for what we know it needs to be, I know that's all of you here today, brilliant, ambitious Haas alumni. I invite you to take a challenge. Grab your phone or whatever you do to keep your reminders and make a recurring 15 minute meeting with yourself for the next five days. Title it, Make Space. You'll be surprised where you end up after a week, after two weeks, and make a practice of it. That's how I know one person in activating the courage of those around me and in stepping into my own power every time I choose to do so. That means you and I can save the world. Thank you. I want to be in person so we can just thunder with applause. B, thank you for putting on your high heels for taking up space, for adopting something I teach, saying, sorry, not sorry, just for pushing the, just the, the walls, the ceilings, the floors, everything that you're pushing against another equity fluent leader. Um, I hope the US who has just gotten back on course around climate change listens to B and moves faster on that course, do the work, Corporations have a place in being activists. So do you. All right. Certainly, last but not even remotely least, we have Robert, Robert Paler. He just graduated in 2020 from our undergraduate program. The title of his more inspiring talks today, Paralyzed to Powerful. I'm not gonna tell his story half as good as he's gonna expand on his story, but in one moment, Robert was living the best day of his life, competing for the 2017 Collegiate Rugby National Championship for Cal. In the next moment, his life changed forever. Robert suffered a severe spinal cord injury, found himself face down on that turf, unable to move anything below his neck. His doctor told him he'd never walk, or move his hands for the rest of his life. Ha! Through his unbreakable vision, the relentless determination, Robert is defying the odds. That's what bears do. He's a member of the Haas School undergraduate class of 2020. He can walk up to 300 yards with the assistance of a walker, and he's sharing his method today and all over the world on how he overcomes quadriplegia. Robert, go! I'm lying in a hospital bed, flat on my back, eyes squinted and utterly exhausted. My ears are barraged by the constant hissing of the oxygen through the mask that keeps me breathing and the alarms from the machines that track my vitals. My mind is racing as I lie there, motionless and completely numb. I am trapped in a body that I don't recognize. Welcome to my personal hell. Just days before, I was getting ready to compete for what I thought would be the best day of my life, competing in the 2017 Collegiate Rugby National Championship. It was in that match that an opposing player made an illegal move 
breaking my neck and severely damaging my spinal cord. In one moment, I went from a division one student athlete living out my dream to a quadriplegic living in my worst nightmare. My doctor told me I would not walk or move my hands for the rest of my life. It was explained to me that things as simple as feeding myself, going to school, doing the things that I loved would be very challenging or impossible for me to do again. That's if I survived. As I lie in my bed, days after my injury occurs, I want so desperately to walk and have my independence again. I think about it and cry about it every day. Even in my dreams, when I can do anything, I choose to do things like footwork drills, stand up from a chair a thousand times, just remember what it was like to be able to move my body. And I want to walk and get better for myself. I want to gain my mobility back for my own personal satisfaction and quality of life. I want it more than anything. It was my commitment. It was my reason to persevere. Whether we realize it or not, we're all committed to something, whether it be to ourselves or to something bigger than ourselves. My commitment was to myself and for myself. And that changed quickly. I used to coach youth rugby camps during the summers of my first two years at Cal. And this, there was this one camper there whose name was Talon. Now, Talon was a smaller kid, but, you know, he played with heart. He was just scrappy, and you rooted for a kid like that. And I remember I'd pick him up, and I'd, like, be bobbing and weaving in between the other 12-year-olds so he could go score, and we shared this real bond. As I lie in my bed, my high school is hosting a prayer service for me to pray for my healing and pray for my strength throughout this recovery. And on this day, my dad shows me a picture of a kid who I don't recognize. Now his hair is thin, his skin is pale, his body is frail and weak. But this kid is Talon, and Talon's fighting cancer. Now as a part of this picture, Talon's mom makes a post and it reads, today we wanted to attend the mass for Robert Paler, a Jesuit this morning, but had to be here undergoing chemo. Talon wanted to show his support for Robert, so he's wearing his rugby shirt that Jesuit gifted him while he was in his first round of chemo. Now this message goes on further to say, we are praying for your healing and a quick recovery. Be strong and keep smiling. Your strength helps Talon stay strong too. Now when I read that message, with tears running down my face, I see a picture here of someone who is fighting for his life. And while he's fighting to survive, he's thinking about me. This kid, Talon, is thinking about others in the lowest moment of his life. In that moment, my eyes open. My perspective shifts and my commitment forever changes. In that moment, I go from dreaming of walking for my own satisfaction to dreaming of walking to inspire others. It becomes so clear to me that overcoming this challenge is not about me. I am just a small part of something so much bigger. In that moment, I make a decision. I decide that in everything I do, it will be to inspire others. I will persevere and overcome my challenges for talent and for all those people who gain strength in my journey. Fast forward to today, I have been battling quadriplegia for 1,449 days. And over these last four years, I went from fighting for my life to twitching a finger and twitching a toe to eventually standing on my own two feet and doing the impossible, enjoying the victory of taking my first steps a second time. This journey has tested me over and over again. And those tests continue to this day. Every day, I work to walk again. Just before this call, I spent three hours working to gain my body back. In the beginning of each of these rehab sessions, I'm kind of cruising along. I'm putting one foot in front of the other. 
by the end of it, I am screaming with every single step. I'm giving everything I have in my mind, body, and soul just to put one foot in front of the other. Now, with each step comes that decision to take another. And I don't make that decision for the pleasure of going from point A to point B on my feet. Because the reality is, walking is exhausting and very difficult for me. It doesn't always hit me with that personal satisfaction. That selfish desire doesn't give me the motivation to persevere anymore. I take that step because my commitment is bigger than myself. My commitment is to talent. It's to all those people who are inspired when I take that step. This is the biggest commitment I've ever made in my life. It's my purpose. So I want you to think, who's your commitment to? Whose life? Are you looking to make better? Is it your coworkers? Your family? Maybe it's your community. Is it someone that you might not even know? When we don't know how to take another step forward, and we're struggling to find a reason to keep moving, our reason is our commitment. A life lived for others is a life of purpose. And that purpose is what makes us go from paralyzed to powerful. Thank you so much. Go Bears. Oh, what a close out to what was already an impossibly high set of speakers quality. I know, Lisa, I had, I had my Kleenex out too. I got to tell you. You're superhuman, Robert. I gotta say, I used to see you around Haas and I just always wanted to meet you. And I just wasn't courageous enough and I'm embarrassed to admit that, but I'm so glad I got to Zoom meet you. I can't wait till we get to in-person meet you. He's, he worked out three hours already today. It's sort of one of those, what have you done? Whose life are you willing to make better? I, I gotta say, Robert, just in the spate of eight minutes, you inspired thousands, we can say, thousands of talents and 154 people on this Zoom call. Do the impossible, keep deciding to persevere. We're pulling for you, Robert, and I have no doubt you're gonna be successful. Oh my God, where do I even start, Tenny? The notes I've taken in terms of what are some takeaways, I'll just give you a few because we have a surprise and then I want you to, I want you to be in the inspirational Zoom rooms with these speakers, break the rules, break them, address the barriers ignite and accelerate change toil as what my one of my favorite qualities of hossies are scrappy entrepreneurial not taking no for an answer using your power to benefit somebody other than you using your power to benefit people who weren't given the power that they deserve step up and stop depreciating yourselves. You heard a theme here of how these incredible leaders depreciated themselves first and unbelievably pulled out your high heels, your power poses, your three hour workouts, your communities, and you're doing it. All right, unbelievable. Tenny, please everybody give that round of applause to our lioness here today who conceptualized this idea nine years ago, humbly asked me to join in. Every year I get more inspired than the last year. Couple messages, a surprise, Zoom rooms, I'll go fast. You can support Haas, your community, in three ways. Hire Haas. We have a 41,000 alums. If you hire Haas, every one of you, we're gonna take over the world. I know that. Uh, post your job opportunities. Details on how to post roles are available on the Haas website. Number two, remain engaged. We are only as powerful as the collectiveness of our community. Keep this alumni network humming along, buzzing, singing, screaming for change with love. I'm so happy I got to work love into my talk today because I'm feeling it. Our strength comes from one another. More information also on how to volunteer on the alumni website, finally invest in Haas. Even if you just graduated, it is never too early to start investing and giving back to a community that has given so much to you. You can make your annual gift to the Haas Fund by 
June 30th, it's coming up faster than we know. The Haas Fund helps strengthen this Haas alumni network, which you as alums utilize, get strength and power and inspiration from every day. I do donate to Haas. I really welcome and hope you'll join me. Okay, we have a surprise. Call me Ace. Drum roll. Yo, yo, yo. Oh, snap, it's on me already. Okay, what's good? Uh, first of all, can y'all hear me? Like, do y'all sound good? I bet. All right, step two, can you hear this beat? This is not the beat I'm gonna perform, but you know, you never know. Can you hear this? Yeah, maybe, no? Cool. All right, teeny bit, teeny tiny bit. Ooh, turn it up, B, what do you think? Turn it up, I bet. Give me one minute, I'm about to disappear and then come right back. How's that? Yeah? All right, cool, that was just a test. All right, y'all, so um, shout outs again to every last person uh, that spoke, it was incredible. Uh, very thankful to just been able to sit here and listen. I felt like I just left away with a lot. And you know, one of those themes for sure, hands down, was um, living with purpose. And um, I, I just love, Robert, the, the last bit that you said, right? Living for others um, and just being committed to you know, using that skill, that tenacity, that strength, the, the, everything that you have, knowing that it's gonna be a blessing to others and not just you. And sometimes that's hard. I mean, most of the time it's hard, right? Um, and, and so, you know, this song that I have off of the last album that I just dropped out of office, it's called Dream. And I wrote this song when uh, it felt like the dream was just a bit too, too not real. You know, you're struggling with the, the desire to hold on, um, but you know that holding on, it's for a reason that's bigger than you. Um, and just everything that everyone said earlier today, you know, just pushing through when it's not, you don't see it in that moment, right? It, it actually just looks very vague and very dark, and oh, I don't know if I'm gonna make it, but just that hope that it might not show up when I want, but it's on time. That's literally uh, the, the, the purpose of this song. Uh, it's called Dream. It's everywhere, you know, YouTube, Spotify, Apple Music, all that fun stuff, but I'm gonna just slide through this song and then we can uh, do the meet and greet stuff, so let's get it. Yeah. Call me Ace. Listen. Now, you got to bet on yourself. True, but ain't now and then it feel like I'm gambling. Lost for words till the words start scrambling. Grab the inspiration, got to write it as I'm rambling. Cut and trim it down like I'm sampling. 3 a.m. bouncing off the walls with adrenaline. Wifey trying to sleep, dreaming about me being a family man. Barely seen her all week. Past issues with abandonment. High grade light up in the nighttime like I'm driving in the ambulance. No coincidence trying to relive who I am again. Past accomplishments in the present start vanishing biggest fear in life is to live like a mannequin look good on the outside but really just standing there ain't going nowhere it's less about embarrassment more about the fact that a hey, blessing i inherited i barely even cherish it Yo, it's gonna be a long night. I had a dream, so I've been working all night. Lord knows I've been pushing for a long time. It might not show up when I want, but it's on time. Yeah, yeah. Yo, it's gonna be a long night. I had a dream, so I've been working all night. Lord knows I've been pushing for a long time. It might not show up when I want, but it's on time. Listen, you gotta bet on yourself, true. Uh, Come to think about it, that's so American. Don't need no therapist. I know you hear me, you could be a good Samaritan. I ain't gonna stress you though. I'ma keep performing though. I hope you like the flow. This ain't Hamilton, but I'm making history for show. Ain't many comparisons. They might rap like me, but don't handle what I'm managing. Don't mean to be arrogant, but all this with no management. Lighting my own candle, man. All while making corporate moves while butchering my grandma, man. Did this with no manuscript, unless you count the Bible. I prefer being 
being evangelists instead of being idle. I run experiments interpreting data like an analyst. Can't nobody tell me what I can or can. If I can, I am. Since I am, I can. Y'all don't understand me, man. Let me stop. Look, yo, it's going to be a long night. I had a dream, so I've been working all night. Lord knows I've been pushing for a long time. It might not show up when I want, but it's on time. Yeah, yeah. Yo, it's going to be a long night. I had a dream, so I've been working all night. Lord knows I've been pushing for a long time. It might not show up when I want, but it's on time. Yes. Go Bears. Appreciate y'all. <laughs> Cheers. Oh my God, if you could have seen the faces of your co-panelists, Ace, I mean, Snap is right. Turn it up. Robert, you have a new soundtrack to motivate you in those three-hour workouts. Download Ace on Spotify. He did not tell me to say that. That is me saying that. Um, and before we move, you can see in the chat, the Zoom rooms are about to open up. Just a personal message to you all who spoke today. Lisa, you're gonna make me cry. Uh, just my face to you because we talked about it on Zoom. I just lost my mother a month ago. And I just wanna say for one afternoon in the past 30 days, you lifted me out of my grief. Thank you so much, completely. All right, go to your Zoom rooms. You can hop around. We have 30 minutes to interact with the speakers. Have at it. Bye everyone.